Our scripture reading comes from the letter to the Hebrews in the 11th chapter, beginning in the 23rd verse. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, and I invite you to listen to this reading of a portion of God's Word. By faith, Moses was hidden by his parents for three months after his birth because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called a son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to share ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He he considered abuse suffered for the Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, unafraid of the king's anger, for he persevered as though he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. And now continuing in the 39th verse, yet all these, though they were condemned for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better, so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. And let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We invite the children to come forward for children's time.
Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's good to see so many of you here today. I have to tell you that the 845 service was, was uh, I, I, I want to be careful about this, but I think it was a near record high in attendance. And I maybe the time change had something to do with that, made it a little easier for people to to get up to the 845 service, um, but it was, it was a good and beautiful day, and it's good to see all of you here. We've been meeting with um, fourth grade and up um, the last month and a half, and uh, some of the students who are sixth grade and up are a part of our confirmation class. It means that they're learning uh, more intentionally about the faith. We've actually been learning about the Apostles' Creed, the different parts, I believe in God the Father, I believe in Jesus the Son, and I believe in the Holy Spirit. And um, what we're going to learn about this evening, just a little preview, is about the church. And then there's this line in there that I thought I would just ask you what you think about it. We say it so often, but I wonder how you would define it if somebody asked you about it. So it starts with, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. What's the next line? The communion of the saints. The communion of saints. So not to put you on the spot, um, I'm not going to come around with a microphone asking a uh, pop quiz, but if somebody asks you, hey, I visited your church, and they said that I believe in the communion of the saints, what is that? What would you say? What would you say? Well, I've thought a lot about that because for me, there are things that I believe in deeply that I sometimes have a hard time articulating. Do you, do you ever have that where you have... You have a deeply held belief, but if somebody says, what does that mean, or why do you think it, you just sort of like, ah, blah, 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 and they're like, okay, thank you for that, I'll, I'll ask somebody else. But I wanted, to, I wanted to think for just a moment about what we mean when we say, I believe in the communion of the saints. I got a couple of thoughts. Going back to when I was in seminary, I went to a service for all saints, and it was actually at night. It was on Halloween night. Because, see, All Saints is always, does anybody know what day? November the 1st. Um, the day after Halloween, October 31st. They go together, All Hallows' Eve and All Saints' Sunday. And so this was actually on Halloween night. And instead of going out to, is, is Ginger here? Not, go, instead of going out to Franklin Street in Chapel Hill, we went to church uh, at the Duke Chapel. And they call it Duke Chapel, but they really should call it Duke Cathedral. If you've ever been to Duke University, I think of chapel like here's the church, here's the steeple. But Duke, Duke Chapel is this giant uh, neo-Gothic church. And so we, we gathered on the lawn, and there were people there, and they were wearing robes this color white. And they were holding candles like these that were lit. And each of them had a little statement that they read in the first person as if they were a saint of the church, you know, uh, St. Jerome, St. Peter, uh, St. Teresa, somebody like that, just a short statement about their life. And at the end of it, they would blow out the candle. And that would symbolize that that saint's life had come to an end. They had died. So there might have been six or eight of them, I don't remember, and they would read their statement, I am saint so-and-so, and then they would blow out their candle. And one by one, they went out. And then we were invited to go in the church and walk all the way up the aisle and sit in the front. I don't know how they did this. They must, have, they must have done, while our eyes were closed praying, all the saints disappeared. And we walked into Duke Chapel, and on the side of the aisles was every one of those people that had been holding a candle. But instead of the candle being extinguished, the candles were lit again. And we were walking in and we were singing a hymn and the people who were holding the candles were also singing with us. And then once we found our seats, they came and they sat with us. I think, I think that's what we mean when we say, I believe in the communion of the saints. There are people whose earthly candle has gone out. They have died. But they're with us still. They're not with us because we're good at remembering. We might be good at remembering. They're not with us but even because they're just so special, even though they're special. Do you know why they're with us? They're with us because of who God is in Jesus Christ. 
We're with us because Jesus is alive. And because Jesus is alive, death is not the last word. So we can say, I believe in the communion of the saints. They're with us. They're with us. That's one way to think about it. The author of Hebrews thinks about it a little bit differently. The author of Hebrews paints a picture of a race in a, good, in a big stadium and says that life is like a race. Is it a marathon or a sprint? I don't know, but it's a race. And the saints, the martyrs, the witnesses who've gone before us are in the stands cheering us on. Life is, is a race and the saints are cheering us on. Have you ever noticed that when normal people go to a sporting event and sit in the stands, they cease to be normal people? <laughs> uh, have, you, have you ever noticed that, that something happens when the game starts and all of a sudden your Sunday school teacher may become something else in, in the stands of a, of, a, of a baseball game or a basketball game? I learned this at a young age in a rather memorable way. Um, we went down to the Atlanta area where a lot of my family is from. My older cousin was playing football for a high school team, and they had made it deep into the playoffs. And so we wanted to go see this game. His mother was my cousin Carol, my dad's first cousin. Carol was so, so sweet. Just one of these people that when she talked, it's just like honey coming out of her mouth. Oh, Thanksgiving, she'd be like, oh, baby, come here. Would you like some pumpkin pie? Would you like some pumpkin pie? Oh, I'll get you more pumpkin pie. Would you like more turkey? Here, you can have them. sweet or unsweet. No, lemonade for you. Moo, 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 moo. <laughs> that was Cousin Carol. The team name was the Mustangs, and when the Mustangs ran on, on the field and she saw her son run out there, sweet, sweet, sweet Carol was right behind my shoulder, and I'll never forget that right then she went, Go Stangs! <laughs> and the whole game, she growled and grunted and screamed like that. She screamed at the refs, she screamed at the other team, she screamed for her team. It was, I, I, the only thing I had learned at that point in life to help me prepare for that was like tornado earthquake drill in school. And I put my head down between my knees, make it stop, make it stop. I didn't want to go to a football game for a long, long time. Something happens to people when they get in the stands. Just a couple of weeks ago, the University of Texas was playing the University of Georgia and the Texas student section didn't like a call, and they got so angry that they threw a big enough fit and threw enough stuff on the field that the referees reversed the call. Bad lesson to learn, right? I saw on the news this morning, just last night, there's a certain university, I won't tell you what it is, it rhymes with Clemson, no, it is Clemson, sorry. <laughs> Same thing happened. They didn't like the way that their team was playing, and they started throwing stuff. These are educated people. These are sophisticated people. What's happening? But being in the crowd can also bring out the best in people. Have, have you ever been a part of a sporting event and looked up in the stands and seen someone that you love that you didn't expect to see there? Or maybe you've been in the band or in the choir, and you look out in the, choir, in the, in the audience, and somebody made a special trip just to see you, what does that do for you? It, it warms your heart. It lifts you up. I, um, I remember in Little League, at the end of the year, the coach was giving out awards, uh, best hitter, best infielder, best outfielder, most improved. He said, I've got a new award to give this year. It was an award to a parent, fan of the year. And he told the story. He said, it's because a few weeks ago, the rain came, our game got delayed by rain, and everybody had gone to their cars, and we were in the dugout, hunkered down, and I looked up in the stands, and there's one parent, it's this guy, he's sitting there with his poncho and his hat, waiting for the game to start. It ended up getting rained out, but he sat there nonetheless. He said, you're our number one fan, and our kids need more fans like that, that are there, rain, shine, good, bad, win, lose. When someone's there for you in the crowd, it does something for you, doesn't it? It does something. And so the author of Hebrews says that the saints are like those in the crowd. But it's not just that they cheer for us. It's not just that we remember them. That's why we use that word. What was that word? Communion. Because just like those saints who sang with us and who worshipped with us, they're a part of us. 
So what kind of a race is it? Is it a sprint? Is it a marathon? Is it hurdles? What kind of a race is it? I think I know what kind of a race. Look at the cover of your bulletin. If you're here, if you're here in the room, look at the cover of your bulletin. What do you see there? It's a relay. Now, I couldn't find and didn't want to ask to borrow a real baton, but I ordered a, a picture a while back, and so this sort of looks like a baton. Um, in, in a relay, you run, but you stop running eventually, and what do you do? You hand it off. And the other runner's right there waiting, ready to take that baton and keep going. The thing about a relay is if I'm running, and I hand off the baton, and my part of the race is over. Is the race over? It goes on. It goes on. And if, if I'm running the race, and I happen to be the last one to cross the finish line, did I win that all by myself? We won it together. And, and I think the kind of race that we're running in this life, and what it means to be in the communion of the saints, it means that this race didn't start with me. There was somebody that came before me, I'm holding the baton now. I hope I've got a long race ahead of me, but I don't know how long. And one day I'm going to hand it off. And that's true for every one of us. And today we give thanks that what's been handed to us, what's been handed to us is the faith of the saints. The belief in God, the belief in Jesus, the belief in the Holy Spirit, learning how to trust and how to live and love like Jesus has been given to us. And we're handing that on to those who come after us. One of the saints that we named, um, when we, I wish I could tell you about all of them, uh, because there's stories about all of them, and they, they all uh, had wonderful witness. But one of the saints that we named is a saint named Press Stanley. How many of you remember Press Stanley? Some of you, some of you knew Press. She had been, been in this church for a long, long time. Um, Press was full of life and love. If, if you knew Press, then she would welcome you in and make you feel like you'd known her your whole life. That's, that's, that's how I felt when I first met her. Um, she was full of life and love. Press was also full of mischief. Um, <laughs> Press was a jokester. So I learned this um, when I talked with her family. Did you know Press... Most grandmothers teach their, their grandchildren how to bake cookies or how to sew. She taught her grandkids how to shoot a BB gun. Um, she taught her grandkids how to break into a Christmas present and, and take out what was in there and wrap it back up as if, as if it had never been opened so you could find out what, we, what you got for Christmas. My grandmother didn't teach me stuff like that. There's a story that one day, I think it was right back here, she, she was sitting right back here, and when the offering plate was about to come around, she reached into the, to the seat in front of her, a woman had left her purse open, and she took her entire billfold out, and she put it in the offering plate when it came by. <laughs> Press was a teacher at Abingdon Elementary School. One day the principal said, I'm sorry, I know that the teachers and the staff love staying after and getting work done, but for security reasons, we've got to shut it down. You can't come in. Press figured out how to sneak in under the security system and get all her friends back in the school and stay as late as they wanted. That was Press. That was Press. Press had a long battle with cancer. She died a little over a year after her husband Jim had died. We had her funeral right here in this room. We told a lot of those stories. We went in procession up to Glade Spring, to Old Glade Presbyterian Cemetery, where she was laid to rest. That was about 2, 3 in the afternoon. I came back down here because that afternoon I was also meeting with Moises and Carrie Martinez to talk about the baptism of their little daughter, Cammie. We decided to meet in here instead of my office. And Moises and I carried that baptismal font that sits in the back. We carried it down and we put it right here. And we sort of let Cammie splash around in the water. I held her for a minute, handed her back. And Carrie put Cammie on the floor to show me how she could crawl. And I watched her crawl right here. And it occurred to me as I watched her crawl, she was crawling with wet hands from the baptismal font right where the casket had been. Here was a saint who was about to start her baptismal journey just as another one had ended hers. And 
Something else about Press. Press is the only person that I've ever, an only adult I've ever had, who heckled me during a sermon. Now, I'm not saying you all should start, but she was the only, the only one to ever heckle me during, during her husband Jim's funeral. I started to tell a story that she didn't want me to tell, and she goes, that's enough, that's enough. <laughs> Do you know who my other main heckler is? The other one that really participates in my sermons? If you, if, when she comes to this service, you know, and at the early service, you know, it's Cammy. She cries, she, she talks back, she chirps at me. And both of these saints love to interrupt my sermons. And I, and I watched as, as Cammy is crawling around here. One's journey is ended. Another is beginning. And I'm not kidding you. On the floor were flower petals and leaves from the arrangements that had been here. And she was picking them up. I saw something else, though. I, 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 I saw something else. I didn't, I didn't think to say anything at the time. I saw a baton. Because one runner was finishing the race and handing it to another to start. Amen.